A lot of constructions and cohomology theory make me wonder, what's the motivation behind all this? After all, being a student of pure math doesn't mean I completely ignore things such as motivation and application. One of the most important cohomology theories, and one that really helped me realize some of the underlying motivations behind cohomology theory in general, is Jerome cohomology. We previously saw that just as homology detects holes in a topological space, cohomology measures those holes. Let's see what intuition to ROM cohomology gives us about these measurements. Now it's not hard to believe that topological spaces exist in the physical world. It would be really nice if we could do calculus on, say, manifolds. This would immediately have lots of applications in physics. As we can recall, one of the most useful theorems in calculus is the fundamental theorem of calculus. It implies, for example, that the value of an integral over a closed curve on a simply connected domain is zero if the antiderivative exists. To paraphrase Terry Tao, Durham cohomology gives us a way to precisely measure the extent to which the fundamental theorem of calculus fails for surfaces and dimensions on those surfaces. In other words, it is possible for the theorem to hold for some dimensions but not others, even though they're on the same surface. As it happens, measuring holds, whatever that may mean, will precisely be what we're looking for. Doing this will require the language of differential forms. I think I'd better defer the discussion of differential forms to another time so that we might at least try to do them justice. Let's try to move ahead for now. First, let's consider the typical situation in R2, where the fundamental theorem does hold. Here, the value of the function along the curve is the projection on the x-axis. As we can see, the value of integrals over a closed curve is zero. Also, note that there aren't any holes here, so in our cohomology theory, we'd like for the measurement for the space we get to be zero. There is no deviation from the fundamental theorem of calculus. But for the second situation, let's consider the vector field y comma zero on the same real plane, now technically R3. In this case, the fundamental theorem fails. The value of an integral over the curve here is not zero. It is slightly positive, but this also doesn't have any holes. It doesn't break the fundamental theorem of calculus either, though. The value of the integral over the closed curve isn't zero because we can't actually compute the antiderivative of the function. So if cohomology measures holes in the space, then we somehow don't want to differentiate these two surfaces. In other words, we want to throw out the vector fields or equations that don't have antiderivatives, ones that wouldn't satisfy the fundamental theorem of calculus, even if we were in a simply connected domain. We need a way to formalize a difference between functions, projection onto the x-axis, and the vector field y comma zero. To see why we need to do this, let's consider this third example. In this annulus, which I'm using to represent the punctured Euclidean plane R2, the argument assigns to each point the angle of the line passing through it from the center. As we can see, small closed curves have integral values of zero. However, larger closed curves, in particular ones that encompasses the hole in the middle, do not do this. The value at the beginning was zero, but after one revolution, the value of the point at the same position is 2 pi. The necessary condition we could impose is that integrals valued over any small closed curve must be zero. This is where differential forms come in. What we want are called closed forms. So we assign a differential form to the space, and this is a closed form if the exterior derivative of this form is zero. What's happening is, we are setting the elements in the cochain sequence to be i-differential forms. 
and the differential map to be the exterior derivative. Our properties are satisfied, as you can check. For example, d squared equals zero. This might not be the place to delve too deeply into the theory of differential forms. An analogy that helps me, though, is thinking about a vector space. A closed form is one where the curl is zero. The vector field is irrotational. Okay, so we should check if this actually lets in the first and third situation, but excludes the second. In the first case, we can see by inspection that as the vector field x comma zero, it is irrotational, so it is a closed form. If we want to be more concrete, however, given that the expression for this argument is say f of x equals x, our differential is the one form dx. The derivative of this is obviously zero, so this is a closed form on the Euclidean plane. Now let's look at the third situation. If we again consider the argument that assigns the angle to a point as a vector field, we can see that it is irrotational. To be more concrete, let's consider the derivative of this argument. Now, I think I'll do a more dedicated explanation of computing the Duran cohomology of this punctured Euclidean plane. In that, I'll focus more on deriving what I'm about to claim, which is this. Even though the argument is not a globally defined continuous function, it is defined over small pieces. So in that sense, we can have global derivative d theta. And this is the following. As we can see, the derivative is zero. So this is a closed form. Okay, time for the second case. Even just by inspection, it is clear that there is non-vanishing curl in this vector field, in particular along the x-axis. To make this concrete, let's consider the associated one form of this space and then calculate the exterior derivative. As we can see, it is not zero. So this is not a closed form. This is all good, but obviously the first and third situations need to be considered as different objects in our cohomology theory. Sure, they both have closed forms, but how can we separate them further? This is where exact forms come in. Exact forms are differential forms which are the derivative of another differential form. Using our vector field analogy, this is the conservative vector field. This does what we want. In the first case, our chosen form is exact. In the third case, our closed form is not exact. It is not the derivative of another function. It's time we brought it all together with cohomology. As we saw before, the cochain complex consists of the set of i-forms on the space, and the differential map is the exterior derivative. The i the Durham cohomology is the kernel mod the image, which is precisely the set of i-closed forms modded out by the i-exact forms. While we won't go through the details, this results in the cohomology groups for the first space to be zero. There is no deviation from the fundamental theorem of calculus. For the third case, the first cohomology group is R, which measures the deviation from the fundamental theorem of calculus for one-dimensional curves. To round out our discussion, I really like how Durham cohomology gives us an intuition for cohomology as well as lets us see one of its major applications. Of course, we have some unfinished business. In the future, we should develop a better intuition for differential forms, as well as getting around to actually computing these Durham groups. Finally, I'm curious to see how these measurements of deviation from the fundamental theorem of calculus aid us in actually doing calculus, as well as if they serve as an algebraic invariant.